Welcome back, everybody. Now, after the excitement and the controversies of rankings, uh, we move on to one of the most fundamentally important missions of a university that no ranking can ever properly capture, their role in nurturing creative genius. I had the privilege of attending the Lindau Nobel Laureate meeting in Germany this year, a quite awe-inspiring event uh, in Lindau. 67 Nobel laureates gave their time and support to 650 young scientists from 88 countries over two days of workshops and discussions and, and social events. And the gathering and my conversations with the great team at Lindau helped to inspire this panel. You know, just how do we inspire and nurture our next generation of top researchers? How do we develop the kind of talent that can come up with paradigm shifting discoveries that change the world? How do we know where and how to channel limited funding? How do we balance a legitimate need for accountability and performance monitoring with the need to instill freedom and risk taking? Uh, in Lindau, I was taken by a presentation by J. Michael Bishop, who shared the 1989 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. And he listed his seven tips for success. And they included a judicious disregard for received wisdom, self-confidence, and one I think which would frighten the administrators and bean counters of universities, a willingness to gamble. I think it's not easy for university leaders in the current climate of accountability and the demand for short-term impact to take the kind of gambles you need to take. Um, Eric Betzig, who was a 2014 laureate in chemistry, he had even less welcome news for those university leaders hoping for a quick and easy route to groundbreaking and heavily rewarded discoveries. The true secret of his success at Betzig, just being left alone and allowed to focus 100% on the challenge at hand. Leaving faculty 100% alone is probably a utopian dream for, for many academics and a tough option for university leaders today. So I'm really, really excited about this session uh, to help us grapple with these fundamental challenges. And we have an absolutely exceptional panel to deal with the issues. Um, we have Wolfgang Huang, the Director, the Executive Secretariat at the Lindau Nobel Laureate Meetings. Um, as I mentioned, Lindau Nobel Laureate Meetings bring together talented young international scientists to discuss scientific and societal problems. Um, his current focus is on excellence in science education and the use of online science platforms and tools. We have Jack Clegg, who is an ARC Future Fellow and Senior Lecturer in Inorganic Chemistry at the University of Queensland. And before joining Queensland in 2012, Jack was Director of Studies at Emmanuel College, Cambridge, and he's been a past participant of the Lindau meetings. They're joined by Vicky Thompson, the Chief Executive of the Group of Eight Universities, who I'm sure you know is a coalition of leading Australian research universities. Prior to that, she was Executive Director of the Australian Technology Network, so I'm looking forward to her policy perspective on this. But to get the session started, I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce Brian Schmidt. Brian won the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics. Uh, after the high Z supernova search team made the startling discovery under his leadership that the expansion rate of the universe is accelerating. But as well as being in the rare position of being a, a Nobel laureate, Brian is also soon to become the vice chancellor of the Australian National University. So he has uh, a perspective on this issue from two sides of the fence. So to get straight down to it, I'd like you to give a very, very warm welcome to Professor Brian Schmidt. Thank you, everyone, and uh, welcome to those who traveled around the world to Australia and uh, the great city of Melbourne. Uh, my remit today is to comment on how we might nurture the next generation of Nobel Prize winners, hopefully providing some insights from my own career and from my own observations from the many prize winners I've had the chance to sit down with, largely at the Lindau meetings. So firstly, let me say when I think of myself, I do not think of myself as a typical prize winner. Actually, I often forget that I am a prize winner. I always sort of feel like I'm living out some fantasy or some, I don't know, horror. I'm not sure which depends on the day. But upon reflection, there really is no typical prize winner. We come from very different types of backgrounds. But there are some commonalities we'll talk about. From my perspective, 
And from your perspective, I have an attribute unusual amongst most of the laureates, which is that I'm young. I'm the third youngest living science laureate on the planet at present. And so in this sense, I'm probably more representative of what the future laureates might look like than some of the other ones, which really represent science in the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and in my case, the very late 90s. The normal long um, gestation time between discovery and prize means that one should not just look to past winners as a guide to what's going to happen in the future. So first about me. I grew up in a very remote part of the United States, Montana and Alaska. My father was a scientist. I always knew I wanted to be a scientist. My mother was working and my father was doing his PhD. We don't call that work, we call that doing something else. And so he had to take care of me and I was in the lab trying to help him. And I realized from a very early age I wanted to be a scientist. Uh, I had good teachers that the uh, U.S. Uh, remote system in Montana and Alaska provide. Uh, you know, it wasn't a highbrow education by any sense, but it was not a poor one. It was very good. I certainly was a good student, but I was not a Carl Friedrich Gauss. Uh, I was really an all-rounder. I did athletics. I did music. I did theater. I did school leadership. And I concentrated on all of my subjects to do well, not just math and science, but I like you know, history and social science and economics. I was there in a special time in Alaska where uh, a lot of resources had been put into the schools, so we had very good resources. And I had a number of, of friends who were intellectually very gifted. One of my best friends who taught my class, I did not taught my class, I finished third. Uh, and one of my friends, one of, still one of the smartest people I know, went off to Princeton uh, to do English literature, ended up writing for The New Yorker. Uh, having that relationship with someone really imprints intellectualism. It's just part of who I am from my earliest days, thanks to that lucky, um, I think, uh, combination of, of having someone so smart in a reasonable uh, environment. I had decided from a young age that I was going to be a meteorologist. Why? I love the weather. I still have a weather. I can look up what temperature it is at my house and my vineyard right now if, if, we, need to, if we need to know that. So I had, had this vision of my life that I was going to be working in a forecast office of the, of the weather service. I then, when I was 16, decided from summer, I said, I'm just going to go volunteer. I showed up and said, will you take me? You don't have to pay me. I'll keep quiet and see what you do. So they said, sure. So I had a great experience, but in that experience I realized working at a forecast office was not what I wanted to do. It wasn't the science that I was expecting. So I had to make a pretty quick decision what I was going to do in life, and I decided to go and do astronomy and physics because I didn't know what else to do. I never actually thought I would be an astronomer. There's only a couple thousand across the world. And I figured everything I learned would be useful for working on something else in uh, my life in the future. Uh, but I knew that, uh, you know, that, that, that knowledge I was going to gain was going to be useful, which is, I think, kind of an unusual perspective for a 17-year-old when I think about it, is that I really didn't think I was going to actually be an astronomer, but I knew it would pave the way for doing something interesting. Of course, I was wrong uh, in the end, but I think that attitude is the correct one we, I try to instill in young people. You can never know the future, and working on something which you love and have passion for is a good way to start. So I chose to go to the University of Arizona because of its excellent research reputation in astronomy. Uh, University of Arizona was, uh, as I found upon my arrival, um, it had been just recently named the Playboy Party School of the Year. Uh, that turns out not to be a leading indicator for rising in the higher education rankings, as near as I can tell. Uh, the Revenge of the Nerds uh, movie had just been filming, uh, finished filming there. And asking around was because they didn't have to pay for any extras and sets. The campus and activities really did look like the movie. I was rather mortified and horrified. Uh, I went to the astronomy department and said, hello, here I am, I'm very keen. And they said, if you ever want to amount to anything, you need to transfer as fast as you can to a university with a better physics department. Uh, we don't take our own undergraduates. So that was week one at university. Uh, I didn't, you know, I wasn't going to suddenly go off and uh, Berkeley had already, uh, for example, rejected my application. So uh, I wasn't going to go off there. Uh, 
So my first year at university was not my happiest, but I, uh, and for the people in the, uh, in the athletic group, I bared down, that's what Arizonans do, uh, is the athletic song. I, and I took my misery out by doing lots of classes. So I did seven or eight classes a year uh, on everything from art history to physics. And I got very good grades in them. It was kind of a surprise to me because I was expecting to go into this big pond and not be very successful. But at that time, more importantly, I started roaming the halls of Stewart Observatory, found a research group there, which I worked in, uh, again, starting for free, and then they started paying, and that was quite novel. And this became my home away from home. By my third year at university, I was friends with all the graduate students, and my senior year, I was taking classes with these students with the astronomy faculty who were some of the most famous astronomers in the world in this very, very good research department in what was an otherwise, I would say, fairly mediocre university at the time. Arizona is a much better university now than it was then. Uh, it's not winning the awards anymore, I'm afraid, uh, for being a party school. Uh, and its physics department has risen up and it complements much better the astronomy department. And so its undergraduates are now actually going out and being quite successful. Uh, I guess the, uh, for the enrollment offers, it's a rather uh, a problem for them in terms of the party school thing, because that's where most of their students came. So when I won the Nobel Prize, I was contacted by a researcher doing research into these things in the United States who simply would not believe that I was a University of Arizona undergraduate. He said, you are the only physics Nobel laureate in the world who has ever went to a school that was not a top 100 physics program as an undergraduate. And I, was, I hadn't really thought about this, and I said, well, I assure you, I did go to the University of Arizona. But I said, you know, I, I, was, I won my, my award in astronomy, and the department there really was a top 10 in the world astronomy department. And he wrote back and said, okay, yes, the order had been restored in the cosmos. And uh, he, he could believe that I, I really did say what I did. But this leads me to a reflection. Environment does matter. It's not just about recruiting the best students to a mediocre department. The vast number of people who do great research, whether or not they win pri Nobel Prizes or not, have come through an academic program of international renown. And I see that in myself because when I was in the mediocre parts of the university, I just went and, hi and hid in my room. But when I was exposed to the great people, great academics, I went out and I interacted with them. And that interaction is an incredibly important part of being an academic, and it makes a difference even at the undergraduate level. I think most of us forget that. Are there diamonds in the rough out there? Absolutely. But it seems difficult to shine in an environment unless you get into a world-leading program at that undergraduate level. And so I don't believe this is just a recruiting issue. I don't think the best universities get all the good students. I have met many brilliant people at non- uh, research uh, excellent universities, uh, but their opportunities to actually go on and do great things within research are much less, even though their intelligence is equal. So it highlights the importance of the opportunities that our best research universities give their students. Based on my academic results at Arizona, and probably more importantly, some of the letters written by these esteemed members of staff, I went off to Harvard to do my PhD. I was actually told, don't go to Harvard, it's a bad institution in astronomy at the time. I visited, it seemed really, really good to me, and that's because reputation's a lagging indicator. And so, you know, Harvard was a disaster 10 years earlier. When I showed up there, it was clearly on the way up, and now it's one of the strongest departments in the world. There, under the supervision of Bob Kirshner, I had really one of the best three years, 11 months, and four days of my life, undertaking my PhD. And during that time, I got to travel the world extensively and essentially meet every major player within astronomy in the world in my field. This is important because when I finished my PhD, I stayed on at uh, Cambridge at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics as a postdoctoral fellow, and I was able to use this network of people, and most importantly, the people I met in Chile, to build up the high redshift supernova team, which uh, is worth talking about how that team was formed. Several major events came together in 1994. My friends in Chile figured out how to measure uh, distances with supernovae for the first time. 
A group at Berkeley led by Saul Perlmutter figured out how to discover these distant objects using the new digital detectors uh, that had been developed, large format CCD devices. And the new Keck telescopes came online. They were the first telescopes big enough to make one of the key measurements reliably of our exploding stores. That all came together in a period of about a month. I was not working on this project. I stopped everything I did and started working on this project. Why? Because I said, this is a perfect storm of opportunity. Now, I only had a two-year, uh, I actually knew I was moving to Australia at this time, so this happened when I was 27. Uh, and so I put together this team of what turned out to be tenured colleagues. I was a 27-year-old postdoc, and they were all had tenure. The youngest person in the group to form and lead the team, and that's something that I, I think we have to understand is very unusual, and I gave, I have great thanks to my colleagues for allowing me to do that. Uh, the person who joined the team later, Adam Reese, who ended up co-sharing, he was 25 at the time he joined the team. So I was on my way to Australia, the ANU, for my next job. And my job at Harvard, I had freedom to do anything I wanted. It was an open fellowship. My job at ANU was a similar three-year position, anything I wanted to do. So I landed in Canberra with this uh, three-year postdoctoral post fellowship and a three-and-a-half-year program to do. So that is one of the issues that we have as young scientists. I worked hard in 1997. Things were looking great. We were really making uh, good progress in the experiment with the uh, promising results coming up in the next six months. But during that time, because I had stopped everything I was doing, I had not been able to publish a lot in the intervening two years. Not zero, but not a lot. And so I applied for a five-year extension to my job, and I finished fourth in that. And that was the only job opportunity I had. My wife had a very good job in Canberra. So I faced leaving academia on the 1st of January, 1998. For me, fortunately, three people turned that job down, and I got my job. On the 26th of February, so that's two days after my 31st birthday, we announced the discovery of the accelerating universe. So five weeks after my job almost came to an end. That is how finely balanced a young research career is. There are a few lessons from my experience that I'll finish up on. I was young and free. This is an almost universal descriptor of the Nobel Prize winners in the sciences when they make their discoveries. They were young when they made the discovery, and I've seen some research saying that they're getting older, but I think some of the more recent stuff that's come back down again. Uh, and they were in situations where they were in charge of their own scientific destiny. They were not working for someone in large groups, except for in the case of some students who were working directly with supervisors. I took risks in my career. I did things and said, I'm not going to play it safe. I'm going to do what I think is the most interesting thing to do. Uh, I did not do lots of medium papers. I chose to go for a couple big ones, and it paid off for me. It doesn't always pay off. I did not know the universe was going to be accelerating. Uh, so my experience is very similar with the other Australian laureates. Peter Doherty was 34 and at the ANU, where I'm at now, when he did his Nobel Prize work. His student, Rolf Zinkernagel, was 30. Elizabeth Blackburn was 38 when she discovered telomeres. Barry Marshall was 33 when he drank Heliobacter culture uh, to show that it caused it ulcers. Uh, and his supervisor, or co co-worker, and I am supervisor, Robin Warham, was 46. He's the old guy in this, in this group. As I said, I was 31 when I made my discovery. If we look across academia and see where the people reach their apex of productivity, there is much evidence to show that it comes before the age of 50. People over 50 tend to be involved in lots of, lots of projects with lots of people. I believe if you end up normalizing by numbers of people and authors, you get quite different results. It's one of the things that concerns me about how we do, uh, how, how we try to assess people. I don't have a great way to fix it, but it's a problem. But if we ask ourselves, where do universities direct our money? We spend most of our money on people over 50. Not just their salaries, but all their research projects with these big hierarchies. The problem is those career hierarchies are not the ones that are going to produce the great leaders of the future. If we look at um, what these career structures are providing for young researchers, the, many of the PhDs are part of huge projects, part of large groups, working on short-term contracts. 
This way of doing science is probably going to change a bit, um, at least for some, uh, because of the large, uh, the large projects and the way science is being done. But how are we going to train the future leaders? These huge teams leaders inevitably do, no, sorry, do not just work themselves up the ladder, rung by rung within their collaborations. The leaders are typically recruited from positions where they have had autonomy, uh, to get at a, given to them at a young age for whatever reason, so they could prove themselves. And so they're able to leapfrog everyone else who's bound up in these big projects. So what's my advice if you want Nobel discoveries at your institution? Put more of your research spend into your under 40s. Provide these people with career structures which have certainty over more than one to three year contracts. Many of the people in the health sciences are on one year contracts now. I don't know how you're supposed to do that sensibly. Uh, and in the end, we need to provide a culture environment where you do not just do this for a few people, you need to build up critical mass. And the catch-22 is that it seems that if you uh, want to produce great academics, you need to already have a strong department. So you sort of need to do a phase change of building up critical mass if, you're, if you have weak areas. Uh, so that is a big challenge for all of us in university uh, uh, administration is how do we make weak departments strong. And you sort of, you don't do it a little bit at a time. I think you actually need to do it with a big bang at some point. And finally, I just want to reflect that Nobel Prizes are a funny indicator. They represent when something unplanned happens. They are a highly celebrated part of our science, but they are not the only part of scientific achievement which we should celebrate. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. There's incredible food for thought there, but I think we should hear from our other panelists before we open it up to debate. So on the theme of being young and free, Jack, I think you represent uh, that, that demographic, so please go ahead. Thank you very much to the University of Melbourne and to the Times Higher Education for putting together such a, an exciting program in a wonderful location. My research area is in chemistry and it interfaces with material science and nanotechnology. And one of my primary methods of characterization is X-ray crystallography. And so therefore it's appropriate, given the subject of this session, to note that it's been 100 years since the first Nobel Prize was awarded to some Australians. A father and son team, William Lawrence, the youngest scientist ever to be awarded the prize, and William Henry Bragg jointly received the prize for the development of X-ray diffraction 100 years ago. <clears throat> so how do we foster the next generation of Nobel laureates? Given where I am in my career, I'll focus my comments really towards factors that will support current students and early career researchers, particularly in issues related to job security and career progression. The simple message I have is that we need to think seriously about the future. If we want Nobel Prize winners at our institutions in 30 years' time, we need to take strategic action now. This is a perpetual problem for blue sky research and big picture science. Strategic vision and investment is required over the medium and long term, well beyond the length of a term of government, particularly in Australia, where we've had five prime ministers in five years, or any sort of national funding cycle. The Nobel Prize winners of three decades hence are our current students and postdoctoral fellows. If we can't keep the best of them in our institutions performing outstanding research, then the research won't be performed and the prizes won't be won. Our international rankings won't be boosted by the presence of Nobel Prize winners on our staff. Perhaps due to my academic interests, I often find my own strategic thinking operating to optimise a recipe. That is either to pro promote a chemical reaction or, I guess, to bake a cake. I see the formula for a future Nobel Prize winner to require the right mix of people, infrastructure and funding, all combined with a little sprinkling of serendipity. All of these things together provide an environment with the freedom to pursue an idea and perform the experiments that are required. I'm now going to look a little bit at each of those in turn. People. Clearly, we need the right people at our institution for them to win a prize. These people need to have received excellent training at both the postgraduate and postdoctoral levels, and the training needs to be academically rig rigorous specific in its content, but also needs to develop sufficient breadth of knowledge and skills to allow those people receiving the training to think laterally and creatively, allowing the identification 
of significant research challenges which will become more interdisciplinary over time. I guess you could say that I'm a strong advocate for liberal or a renaissance style of education. Like Brian, I studied chemistry, history, law and music. I did all of the things in all of the different ways I could throughout my education. This approach will not suit everybody, but everybody will not win a Nobel Prize. So whatever training is provided, it needs to be tailored to the individual rather than mandated for the masses. Self-determinism and individualism must be recognised along with leadership. I take the opposing view to Vicky, as she wrote in the paper this week, and suggest that the quality of research that an outstanding graduate student pre performs is a function of the student themselves rather than the institution at which the student is enrolled. We do, however, need to be aware of the cultural perception that doctoral training is training to be an academic. This is no longer the case, and we need to explain to the public the generic values of this training. We have to remember that less than 20% of our PhD students will end up as permanent academic researchers. Research training no longer stops at the postgraduate level. It continues on to postdoctoral research, where students really start to build their autonomy and independence and start to identify significant research challenges. The vast majority of our PhD graduates require this further training. There could always be more of these positions, but realistically, there is a reasonable number available. The biggest challenge to this group is job security. Postdoctoral fellowships are generally short-term contract roles. The stress and long lead time of finding the next position is a significant hindrance to the research that is performed in these roles. It can take for up to a year to find the next position. This uncertainty often comes at a time when young researchers want stability. It's about the time that they think about getting married, they want to start a family, etc. And this leads many of our best and brightest to exit research altogether. Contributing significantly to this lack of low-level academic is a lack of low-level academic positions. Indeed, the corporatization of universities and the funding bodies has also created a whole range of categories and KPIs that researchers need to fit into or tick off before they can get the next position, something that often detrimentally changes the direction and the quality of the research being performed. For example, I'm 33, and although potentially I have at least 30 years left in my research career to come, I'm considered a mid-career researcher. In Australia, we have an ageing population and universities have the same problem. What should look like a pyramid of academics in most institutions, that is, a lot of academics and senior lecturers, very few associate professors and professors, is actually inverted. We have a whole heap of professors and associate professors and very few researchers starting out at the bottom. This is not a way to think appropriately in terms of our investment in the future of our own institutions our own research or anything else. After we have good people, we need good infrastructure. This is pretty simple. In addition to local infrastructure at institutions, there's a significant need for national and international scale equipment and facilities. Things like telescopes, nuclear reactors, particle accelerators are all necessary and must be accessible. It's not enough, however, just to construct these facilities. They need to be supported. The support needs to be sufficient and ongoing. A prime example of some of the problems is here in Melbourne. So the Australian synchrotron just down the road is a wonderful facility, but it does not have sufficient funding certainty. So at the moment, none of its staff have any sort of job security at all, and currently there's industrial action taking place. So this disrupts the use of equipment. In fact, just yesterday, my beam time was cancelled. My team of eight had spent nearly three months preparing samples, all for the experiments we were to perform, but to no avail. No security of funding, no results. Lastly, I want to talk a little bit about funding. I'm sure we can simply all agree that funding blue sky research is an investment in the future. It is investment in future products, future jobs, the training of future leaders. It is investment in the future economic prosperity of the nation making the investment. The future we're talking about is not the next week, or the next year, or even the next term of government. It is more distant than that. The potential returns are not just monetary, they are cultural, societal, academic, and often difficult to measure. Every investment has its risks, 
but because of the nature of potential rewards of investment in blue sky research, the government is, will and should continue to be the major funder of research globally. The investment government is making, however, needs to be made with a longer term view. Some of you might have noticed that I've avoided using the word innovation. Innovation simply means to make changes or introduce something new. It is often used to describe the development of a new product or service. While there is undoubtedly some inventive step in each new innovation, they are typically characterised by incremental developments in technology, the iPod or Uber being examples. Innovation simply requires excellent education, technical skills and the identification of a market, along with sufficient investment to achieve a series of short-term goals, allowing corporations to be active participants in this space. I think of research as much longer term. It's very much the same, but it has long-term goals, and that means that government needs to support it. In Australia, the level of government support simply needs to be higher. How can we convince government of this, however? To do so, we need to separate any discussions about funding tertiary education from discussions about research in universities. This is challenging as the two areas are and should be inextricably linked. This is the only way that we will convince government to take a longer term view of funding research and research training. The government has an opportunity to look beyond the political cycle and make an investment in the future of our nation. If we're lucky, we might even pick up a Nobel Prize or two on the way. Thank you very much, and let's move straight on to, to Vicky. Thank you very much, and it's um, interesting. We have disagreement already, so I'll be interested whether we can tease that out a little bit. So I'm the only non-academic, obviously, on the panel, and uh, I bring a, a, a different perspective, and that is as chief, of, uh, chief executive of the group of eight universities. And we certainly have some strong and compelling views on the subject of how we actually nurture our future Nobel laureates. But I thought I should delve into some history first. I found that, for example, George Beadle, who won a Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1958, said, study diligently, respect DNA, don't smoke, don't drink, avoid women and politics. So I'm not sure how much we'd want to progress that methodology today. Uh, Leon Liederman, who won a Nobel Prize for Physics in 1988, suggested compulsive dedication to work that engages hearts as well as minds. Now, I'm sure that that is something that we would agree with uh, when we're looking at the Nobel Prize being the highest intellectual award in the world. And of course, the Group of Eight is extremely proud of the fact that the 15 Nobel laureates awarded in Australia have all been associated with Group of Eight members. However, how to nurture Nobel laureates for Australia into the future is, as we know, a whole different story. First, in such a competitive global marketplace, it seems glaringly obvious that we must first provide the right environment. As, as Brian said earlier, environment does matter for our researchers to even stay here in the first place. Compulsive dedication to work that engages hearts as well as minds may not be enough in 2015 and beyond. So we do need to look at the environment in which we are operating. We need to ask very seriously, why should our young researchers even stay here? Why study here? Why choose to research here if we, and by that I mean Australia, cannot provide an environment that encourages them, supports them, values them, and to use that all-important word that we're here talking about today, nurtures them. Today, the world is always on offer, easily on offer, to the brightest and the best, and that means we need them more than they need us. So to all politicians and those architects of good public policy, please keep making your speeches and statements about how much Australia will benefit from being a knowledge economy and how much science matters, but also we need action. Do something about it by recognising this actually takes both significant political will and the proper level of financial commitment. Universities cannot do it alone. And I'm sure everyone in this audience knows that the more research we, particularly the Group of Eight, do in Australia, the more money we must find to fund that research from another bucket, the cross-subsidisation that, that Jack referred to. This is simply because university research in Australia is only ever funded by, uh, by government in, in a partial way. 
The Group of Eight has 67% of Australia's era five world-leading research groups, the natural habitat of a Nobel Prize winner, such as Professor Schmidt's astronomy group at ANU. The percentage of Group of Eight research at this level is more than three times that in the rest of the sector. In 2018, we earned 68% of all research income to Australian universities and 64% of the government block grants to support research, a grand total of $3.4 billion, which sounds a lot. But the Group of Eight actually spends $6 billion on research each year, and $2 billion of that is spent on critical medical research. So simple maths tells you that $3.5 billion in and $6 billion out leaves the Group of Eight universities a long way short of the sustainable research funding that we so need. Both major parties in Australia have cut funding for higher education in the past three years. Since 2012, almost $1 billion has been removed from research funding programs. A further $262 million over three years was removed from the Sustainable Research Excellence Fund in this year's budget. So the major parties are really peas in a pod when it comes to funding universities. They just go about it in slightly different ways. So this means Australia's researchers, one or more uh, of whom could very well be that future Nobel laureate, whom we should be nurturing, suffers the most. The financial aspect of this is certainly fundamental from our view. If I can put it crudely, it really is put your money where your mouth is. Researchers research for the pure and determined love, dedication and commitment to it. They research for our global benefit far more than their own. And as I keep hammering home to anyone who will listen, including crossbenchers when I get them in front of me, it's us, every single one of us, who benefits from the results of that mentality, that research, every single day. And it should be blindingly obvious too that they work best where they are actually appreciated. I don't think that's really so difficult for policymakers to understand, but we often don't see the same corresponding uh, policies. Delivering that appreciation is quite simple. We know other nations do it. In OECD terms, we lag horribly in our prioritisation of research spending, which is really another way, I think, of saying we lag horribly in Nobel laureate nurturing. OECD data for 2013 shows Australia ranks 18th out of 20 countries for government spending on R&D at 0.44% of GDP. So this leaves us uncomfortably nestled between Greece and Slovenia and at less than half the level of investment of OECD leaders. What appreciation means is recognition of the basic tools researchers need to do their job. Infrastructure, as we've heard, equipment, space and support. And all of this comes back to adequate funding to do what needs to be done. Josef Rotblat, the physicist who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1995, said that science is the exercise of the supreme power of human intellect. Australia must harness that supreme power tightly, not let it disappear or dissipate, or our past Nobel Prize winners may be our last for a very long time to come. I'm someone who never finds researchers to be too greedy. That's often an accusation that is levelled at our research community. As with their missing egos, their mindset is too focused on reaching the goals that benefit society. They are a group who only raise their voices in protest as a very last resort. So what they ask for is indeed what they need, the tools of their trade. It's these tools that create the environment that would allow us to, to further nurture future Nobel laureates. There's another important aspect to this also. I was fascinated to read how many Nobel Prize winners, the majority, so profusely thanked a mentor for their award. But you can't have mentors if they're not there to have. So we don't only need to nurture a generation's potential Nobel laureates, we all are also responsible for nurturing a future generation of mentors. This is really all about getting back to basics. If we value ourselves and our nation's future, we will value our university's researchers. Because if we don't, then another nation almost certainly will. In closing, there is another critical element that I must mention and has been mentioned uh, significantly this past week. The Group of Eight takes what we believe is a sensible and logical stance that the taxpayer funding of university research should be directed to supporting excellence, the best research in Australia, wherever it occurs. 
scarce public money should not be wasted on mediocrity. To develop the Australian researchers of the future, to develop the environment that we've heard about, our nation needs to build up a high quality, world class research environment. Mediocrity damages the future of our young researchers and weakens the potential for future Nobel laureates. There must be quality to ensure quality outcomes, and that funding should go to where that quality is. The Group of Eight believes that means, in terms of the research training environment, a minimum era of rate rating of three is required as a minimum condition of RTS funding. And that has caused some debate, and I'm sure we'll have that discussion in our panel discussion. I'm, I'm interested to hear what others think of that. But when we talk about future Nobel laureates and the mentors they so laud, we have to realise that putting funds where they should go into excellence is integral. Our future Nobel laureates will only exist if they are trained where there is a culture of research excellence. We are now in an election year, so the airing of this subject matter is very, very timely. Wouldn't it be wonderful if our politicians showed by their election policies, and I mean all politicians from all sides, that they cared as much about nurturing future Nobel laureates as we do? Thank you. taken by what you're saying about mentoring and one of the things I was so impressed with Lindau about is the fact that so many Nobel laureates give their time to spend days with young researchers so perfect opportunity to hand over to you Wolfgang. Well thanks Phil, um, thanks for inviting me to Melbourne and um, um, having me speak at this panel. Yeah I'd like to share a few uh, observations from the Lindau meetings, that's mainly my job, what I do. Um, just a few words, you've introduced the meetings already. The concept is and goes back to 1951 to invite all the Nobel laureates of one discipline plus the best young scientists you can find in, in all the world for a week in Lindau, put them together on an island and wait for inspiration to happen. And that works quite well, actually. And the last meeting, as you said, had uh, 65 Nobel laureates, more than 600 young scientists. It's a packed program, discussions, lectures, uh, master classes, and so on. Um, we do have some sessions that focus on career topics, ethics in science, gender issues, um, and the career topics are very popular among the young um, <coughs> participants. Um, they're not so popular actually among the, the laureates. Um, um, you can disagree at any time, Brian, like but <laughs> um, it's quite interesting. If we look at um, the feedback we're getting from the laureates, um, and there's also a survey that we hand out to them and ask them to fill out, they tend to say, or the majority of the feedback is, that the students in these times are too much concerned about things like career progression. Um, they're more interested in getting a permanent position than in doing uh, exciting research. And I'm, I know I'm, I'm, maybe I'm going to get some uh, contradiction uh, from, from the panel here. But that's what they have, they've been telling us. So um, the advice they would be giving, or some of them would be giving, is actually that young scientists should do what they really want to do, should research what they're really interested in, and try to get out of their comfort zone. So I don't, want to impro um, I don't want to promote job insecurity, but um, the idea of uh, a situation where you don't have to worry so much about career progression or your career at all, where you can spend all your energy on uh, your research, that's maybe an interesting thought. Second observation, um, just a brief and, and uh, totally not complete look at history. If you look back to Einstein, for example, who was sitting in his patent office in Bern and was very bored about what he was doing, and then he came up with his theory. Um, or if you look at Barry Marshall, we heard about him uh, earlier, um, who drank a Petri dish of Heliobacter pylori to prove his theory. Or if you think about the most recent physics laureate, Stefan Hell, um, who had the idea to uh, go beyond Abby's law, and everyone told him that's totally impossible, and he wasn't offered a job anywhere in Germany or in Europe, and he had to go to, well, Finland is in Europe, he had to go to the University of Turku in Finland. I don't know how that is in the rankings, Phil. Um, at that time, I, I suppose it wasn't in the top places. Um, and there he did his research. In the end, uh, he was right, and well, he didn't break the law maybe, but he got past it. Um, so the lesson from these examples one of my favorite examples is Dan Schachtman, an, an uh, 
Nobel laureate from Israel, actually, who's been doing research on quasi-crystals. And uh, he's got lots of opposition during all his research. And uh, Linus Pauling, one of the few laureates who got two Nobel Prizes, once said to him, there's no such thing as quasi chrysalis there's only quasi-scientists. Um, so these examples uh, should show you that the advice maybe to be taken from here is um, don't make yourself too dependent on academic structures if you're a young scientist, and don't go too much into the mainstream thinking. Um, stay independent in a way. The third thought um, came to me when I was thinking about this panel. Actually, Brian participated in our closing panel in 2014. Um, the title was Science for the Benefit of Mankind. That's a quote from uh, The Last Will of Alfred Nobel. And the group was discussing um, what is science for the benefit of mankind. And we had, for example, Francoise Barisinoussi, the French Nobel laureate who won the prize for uh, discovering the AIDS virus. And um, her work maybe saved the life of hundreds and thousands of people or uh, helped to improve their life. And we had a very special moderator, and he approached uh, Brian and said, well, Brian, justify yourself. How does uh, researching the uh, expansion rate of the universe contribute to the benefit of mankind? And I had contributed to compiling that panel, and at that moment I thought, oh god, he's going to be so embarrassed, he's going to leave the stage immediately. Um, and he didn't, thank you. Um, and he responded in a very nice way, uh, two-part actually. Um, he told the audience about the desire of mankind, the thirst for knowledge is one part, and then he told us about some of the byproducts of astronomy research, such as uh, camera sensors and Wi-Fi and other things. So the lesson to be learned here is um, when you do science and when you do research, don't only judge by the outcome that you can see. Um, that's especially true for basic research. Um, so I think these would be three observations from uh, what we're doing at the Linda meetings. Of course, they're all not my own. They're all derived from what we hear from Nobel laureates. But the session is, the session is about nurturing the next generation. Um, I know I'm not talking to young scientists here, um, um, mainly university administrators, uh, managers of science. So what can you actually do with these uh, pieces of advice? I think you would have to translate them, create an environment, and to quote what has been said earlier from Brian, um, create an environment where scientists, young scientists can be young and free, masters of their own destiny. Um, mentorship has been mentioned. I think that's a very important part, and that is frequently also mentioned by the Nobel laureates we're talking to. And about career progression, um, create an environment where there is enough security that people don't have to matter about their career progression, um, where they're secure enough to follow the research they're interested in. So that would be my summary, my observations. Maybe they're helpful to some extent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I have many of my own questions, but that would be an abuse of my position. So I, if I could see some hands, that would be really helpful. I think one of the things that's just so many themes there, especially around you know how we look after our early career researchers. I mean, Jack, do you think it's fair to to say to a young researcher that hey, don't worry too much about job security. This is a this is a vocation, a passion. You know, don't worry about terms and conditions. I mean, that, that's the challenge, isn't it? Can we provide the right conditions for young researchers that they actually choose? the academy, they choose a university life beyond the private sector. You know, the great brains, are they increasingly at risk of being lost to, 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 to the private sector? Can we, have we done the right thing in terms of giving them the conditions they need to thrive? With the risk of sounding like I'm retreating up the ivory tower, I'm firmly of the view that universities shouldn't provide vocational training. I, I really don't think that's where we are. Obviously, we're doing more and more of that to chase training money to support our research to cross subsidise what we're doing. But through all of our undergraduate and postgraduate um, training, we really should be training people in transferable skills rather than for a particular profession. The first thing that I tell my students when they come into my lab is that it's unlikely that you're going to get an academic job. That's unfortunately how it is. And so you need to focus on the things and the research and the interests that you're pursuing in your work with me 
to focus on how those things could build your future career wherever that may be. Partly because they've never thought about where it is that that career with that PhD could take them. And like I said, less than 20% of those graduates are going to end up in academic or even research careers. It's really important that they think about what else they could use those skills for. In one sense, a PhD or doing a PhD is really like having a first job for these students. You know, a lot, they're on a, on a scholarship, they're in there turning up nine to five, doing whatever it is that they're doing. So it is really their first chance to find out really what they want to do. And that's also sometimes disconcerting if they don't know what the next step is. Brian, do you think, do you think there's a, an issue around the support networks? When Times Higher Education write about PhDs, early careers, there's, there's a huge amount of personal angst, anxiety, lots of talk about mental health issues, about isolation. Is it almost that you, you just, to, to, to take your research to the next level, do you have to just be so incredibly robust that we are prepared to allow that sort of sink or swim approach? What, what can universities do from the leadership level to try and ensure that you're providing the environment that, that, that nurtures these people rather than grinds them down or grinds them into the ground? So I, I guess from my perspective, we need to provide a structure that has a little more clarity about it. Uh, I think we need to, as I've already said, most people do their best work before the age of 50 and most before 40, I think, when you really look at it. So I think we need to have sort of a, a decision process that rather instead of putting people on three, four, five short-term contracts and then cut them loose at 45, I mean, that's pretty tough on people. Uh, I think we need to, to look at uh, finding people, and it, it's quite discipline dependent, so we have to be, I, you know, it's not one size fits all, but I think you need to start, you know, Choosing the people who you're going long, you know, going to go long term with, giving them the resources to do stuff when they're young, rather than torturing, you know, having about ten people all given mixed signals to, of which one tends to squeeze out at 45. But of course, you put them into that pressure cooker, under resource them in their best, most uh, productive time of their lives. So I want to see us go through and be honest with people and say, most of you are not going to make it. But at least we're going to give you an indication relatively early on. And the ones who do, and you can get on, most of you are going to get great jobs. You'll make more money than if you stay in academia. But those of you who do stay, we're going to invest in you early so you can do and get the most out of your lives. Thank you. I'm still looking for hands. I'm going to come out and just force a question on you if you don't get your hands up. But uh, there are so many issues I'd like to discuss. Vicky, you. you research training yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. point and, and PhD training. I think it's really interesting um, uh, uh, from my perspective um, in my former life at the Australian Technology Network of Universities I um, established a pilot centre for doctoral training in maths and stats and we completely um, plagiarised the idea from the UK and the UK training model because we recognised that as you point out, not all um, PhD students are going to stay and research in academia and many need to go out into industry. Um, that centre is humming along quite nicely. I've left so I don't know how it's going but I'm assuming it is and I, I think there are some ATN people here who may be able to tell you that. But one of the, the really huge challenges in setting that centre up was actually in uh, the supervisors of the students who, who actually in some cases didn't want those students to go and do other parts of their course around, you know, the generic skills that you talked about. Um, so we had ethics, we had com um, management. Um, there were a whole range of, of other courses attached to this particular training model. And I can remember students actually phoning me saying, look, we really want to come to the St James Research Ethics Centre here in Melbourne because that's part of the course. But my supervisor has said, that's a waste of time. You're here to do your PhD. You're not here to do that. And that was at a group of universities, and I'm sure that happens at all groups of universities, but that was at a group of universities which prides itself on its industry co connectivity and, and adding, you know, bolting on other skills. So I think there's some systemic problems as well in terms of the attitudes. If we're talking about mentors and supervisors, I don't know how to crack that nut. I'd be interested in, in other views, but I do think that there's quite an issue that we're not, we don't address significantly. Uh, look, Ed Byrne from King's College London. Uh, uh, sort of a comment and a question. The, the comment is uh, really in response to one of Jack's remarks, and I, 
I, uh, when he said uh, he may be retreating further up the ivory tower, uh, because I think the debate uh, as to whether professional disciplines are part of universities or not uh, was settled many generations ago that we have law schools, we have medical schools, we have engineering schools. Uh, we teach people for the professions as one of the many very varied things we do. And there are only a handful of universities that, among the great universities in the world that don't do that. Uh, but a more pertinent remark um, for the panel, really, a question. Um, you know, this question of um, uh, very pure blue sky research versus applied research, what some people think of as the Bohr quadrant, uh, the Pasteur quadrant in the middle, uh, and the Edison quadrant. Uh, I think it's crucial in this time of impact where universities must demonstrate their relevance in the broadest sense to the world at large, and this includes the great universities, that while certainly preserving our focus on the Bohr quadrant, we don't minimize the importance of the Edison quadrant uh, and don't state that universities don't have a major role there because personally I believe they do. So I'd be interested in the, it's a little different perhaps Jack to what you were saying, but I'd be interested in the panel's views on impact relevance, uh, Edison uh, complementing Bohr rather than Edison is, uh, is perhaps not so significant. Thank you. Who wants to take that one? Perhaps I should just clarify one thing and say I, I don't mean that we shouldn't teach law and medicine at universities. I suppose what I mean is that beyond that university training, professions also take a role. Right? So we shouldn't be taking our law graduates and putting them straight into a law firm straight away. There's still additional training that goes on in the professions. What we need to do is train our law graduates to be able to work vote in a, in a non-law setting. So I've never practiced law, I have a law degree. I still saw that as one of the most um, beneficial and wide-ranging areas of study in which I participated because it was non-vocational, although it was related to the law. Brian, what about this issue of, of short-termism, the demand for impact versus the curiosity-driven yeah, situation? Yeah, so uh, one of the things I face uh, at the ANU, for example, is that uh, we've been very strong at doing uh, Long-term research, we have been quite low, quite poor at doing, uh, translating that into things that the rest of society are particularly interested in the short term. Uh, if you look at the great universities, most of them in your rankings do both, and they do both pretty well. Your top ten, pretty good. You have a great synergy between researchers, uh, and, uh, you know, startups, business, uh, all sorts of uh, parts of government. And, and so that is a culture issue. And it's the, the, as soon as you find people, I'll, I'll meet people from, for example, MIT or Caltech, uh, who are addicted to startups. And they're still doing great research and basic stuff. But they, that's sort of their side little hobby. They're, oh, I'm, I'm, my, my goal is one of these a year. And they're, they're addicted to it. There's a culture to it. And, you know, once you make a, I guess, a, you, you make these things happen, they're not really doing it for the money. They're doing it because it's exciting. So I, I do think that is an important part of a university. Uh, but I, I think the foundations of the university, of a great university, is doing great knowledge-based research. And then, uh, and, and so, you know, a, a secondary part of that, and not too secondary, is to make sure that the culture is there so the 95% of the people who you train who don't go on to education are able to do great things. In the US, the dynamic makes a lot of money. Stanford makes less than $100 million in direct technology transfer, but it makes more than a billion dollars from its alumni who have become rich through this process. So if you can get it working well, it's a great way to make your university rich. Uh, most of the world has not figured out how to, in some sense, monetize that impact. Vicky, do you think, is there a, is there a government problem here that they, they demand so much accountability for their money that, I mean, they'll be seeing this in the UK and the US, this, this demand for real clarity on the outcome of the money they spend on universities, that they're forcing universities into this real short-termism that actually <coughs> works against the, the, the freedom that's required to, to pursue blind avenues or to make mistakes or, the, or to take that process? 
So this seems to be a policy um, mountain too high to climb for Australia in a, in, a, in a sense. If we look at what is happening in the, in the UK through the REF and the assessment of research impact, Australia um, has been looking at how we do that for as long as I've been around the sector, and that's not as long as many sitting around here, but certainly for the last 13 years, we have been looking at how do we actually assess research impact. And we need to look at why do we need to do that? Because we need to have the right policy levers in place so that we have, um, we have it's not an either or argument, we have both funding and policy levers in place for knowledge-based, pure research, and we have the same for applied and experimental development and impact. And we haven't, Australia, we can't do that. I was very encouraged to hear the minister this morning actually talk about, he used the word impact, and impact in Australia has been a bit of a dirty word. And if you remember, and many here who have had an association with both the Group of Eight and the Australian Technology Network of Universities, it was those two groups of universities with um, two or three non-aligned universities who actually ran a major trial to look at how we assess research impact. It can be done, it's, it is difficult, it is challenging, but we just don't seem to have been able to get the government, um, in, or the government uh, momentum, if you like, to actually, to actually do it. Thanks. We, we have a question there, and if we can, when that's questions, ask this, if we can get the mic to these two people here, and then we'll take those two questions at the same time. So sorry, thanks for waiting. Good morning. Um, my name is Sarah Niss from Wiley. Um, I also run a group, uh, a lean-in networking group of women um, leaders in business up in Queensland. So Brian, you touched on the point of supporting young Nobel laureates, um, and Vicky, um, you've touched on also supporting people in, in moving up in the industry. I just wonder what the panel's views are in additionally supporting women in this field um, and further um, enhancing that attention. Well, uh, I've spent a lot of time in this space over the last uh, couple years because I think it's a place where we have a chance to improve the current state of things probably uh, with a bit of effort relatively easily. I'm not, we're not going to completely fix the problem. So. Uh, creating an environment that I've told you which gives people at least a little bit of certainty, and there's almost none, is also going to make it, I think, easier to keep and attract women, uh, especially post-PhD. The, the situation we have right now is, is that we have a very, uh, uh, you know, a very savage system that, uh, you know, natural selection plays a role in. But it's not the best who stay, that get selected. It's the people who can stand the system that stay in. And uh, that turns out to preferentially uh, cause women, it seems, to leave the, the, the acad academic environment. And so we need to fix that system. And so it, uh, as I said, going early, I think, will help a lot. Uh, we need to look at all the other little things that universities do. Um, and so the Athena Swan program from the UK, we're doing a pilot right now in Australia, um, which I'm one of the co-chairs of. And so that's really to get the people here in Australia to look at the situation here. What are we doing wrong? How can we improve? Make those improvements and then see how well that works in, in a, hopefully a virtuous cycle. Did you want to come back on that? Oh, look, I think we've identified many of the challenges um, for, particularly for women in, in, in research when we look at the age profile and just what happens externally. I mean, there's a lot that the universities can do and are doing, and I know that, but there are a whole lot of external factors which are broader, as we both know, in terms of what happens at certain points in your life, generally family, I think Jack touched on that. So there are many challenges which we've, we're very uh, good at identifying, um, and, and working towards them is, is, is where the problem is, I think. We don't quite get there, but the virtuous kind of outcome that you talk about is what we'd probably be hoping for. Thanks. I just wanted to squeeze in two questions, so one here quickly. A quick question. Good morning. My name's Monique Skidmore. I'm a Deputy Vice-Chancellor at the University of Queensland. A great university is also one that nurtures its arts, humanities and social sciences, in which it's, and one could argue that a soul of a university is as much in its art, its music and its improvements of social justice, diversity, tolerance in societies as it is to its life-breaking, to its groundbreaking HIV vaccines. And, I want, and the data is, is, is correct in that physicists do their best work younger than any other 
academics, but it grows older as people move uh, outside the hard sciences. Cezanne, for example, many of the world's greatest painters sold uh, more money, uh, more paintings for higher amounts in the last years of their life than at any other time. The uh, first Nobel from the University of Queensland will most likely be in poetry, not even in our hard sciences. So looking forward to the big bang, Brian, that occurs next year when you uh, take up the ch vice chancellorship of the ANU, but wondering, as an interesting question, how it is that we therefore nurture Nobel laureate type behaviour in the humanities and social sciences when we need time to read and reflect and actually grow older before we do our better work. Thank you. Does anyone want to come back on that while we get the mic down here? Oh, perfect. That's great because so, we're close for time. Uh, it's a real interesting issue. Uh, the, it is certainly true the age profile that I refer to in the sciences, and I did try to make a science bit on it, uh, doesn't really apply in the same way uh, within the arts and humanities. Uh, so you have a different structure there. Uh, arts and humanities in this country is not really based on research income. It's quite different teaching parallel. Uh, uh, teaching as being the, the foremost thing that you do and you sort of build up this expertise over decades while teaching students. The problem, of course, for we, we have in Australia is that the numbers of students and the amount of time don't really add up very well. Uh, so in the end, I think you need to have a career that is appropriate for that area and I think it is an important part of the university that uh, it was certainly important to me and it's going to be important at the ANU. Uh, but you need to essentially have a career path that is appropriate there, and I think in the arts and humanities it involves, uh, again, relatively early investing in people, knowing it's a 20-year process. You choose well, you performance manage people out if they completely fail at the age of 45 or 50, I suppose, uh, but you really need that amount of time to figure out how well they're doing, and in the meantime, they're going to have higher teaching loads than other disciplines because they're doing sort of a, a different career path. Wolfgang, can I ask you to come in on that one as well about how do we ensure we continue to actually recognize and reward great research in arts and humanities? I think so many of the funding systems, obviously the award systems, tend to be focused outside that. What, have you got any thoughts there? That's very true. Um, if I look at my own work, uh, we, we mainly do, we do the meetings on the natural sciences and economic sciences, and so there's some disregard for literature and peace if you only look at the Nobel Prize uh, categories. The interesting thing, I don't know if that answers your question, um, the interesting thing is that we see, uh, especially in the Nobel laureates, there's so many uh, who have great interest in uh, social sciences and the arts especially, and uh, it's, it's a special thing in Lindau that uh, anyone can speak about any topic they like. And with many laureates, we see that, and they speak about art, they speak about a lot about music. Many of the laureates are very talented musicians. Um, and that leads me to believe that, of course, um, being a social scientist uh, myself by training, it, it's very important to put a lot of focus on that as well, um, even though there may be no uh, Nobel Prize for political sciences or social sciences or anything like that. It's an important part. And perhaps there's a sense that a lot of the next step in terms of groundbreaking work might be much more interdisciplinary anyway, much more of a fusion between the arts and social sciences and, and hard sciences perhaps. Um, I'll just point out that in the arts and social sciences, the lack of level A positions or postdoctoral positions is even more stark. We produce PhD graduates and there are even less positions for them at universities to go into. Well, when I think that's it. I started studying literature. The first advice was when I came to university first day, there's no future in literature, okay. which well, is true to some extent. That's all we have time for for this panel. So I'd just like to thank the panel once again for a really stimulating conversation. Thank you.